Dr. Jason Saunders here, and as promised, I wanted to bring you guys an update on the use of hyperbaric oxygen for COVID-19. And uh, so there's some really interesting updates that I want to share with you today. Uh, before I do that, I, I just want to briefly uh, go over why somebody would use hyperbaric oxygen uh, for these COVID-19 patients. Uh, and there's multiple reasons, but I think the most important two that we should discuss. Um, one is because of the, the low oxygen levels that are being found in these patients and, uh, and bringing the oxygen levels up is, is really w what's critical. And so, you know, in many cases, in almost all cases that are severe, uh, these patients are being uh, innovated and, and put on a ventilator. And so the question becomes, you know, are there alternatives to using the ventilator uh, for some of these more severe cases, especially if we catch them on the earlier side? And so um, using hyperbaric oxygen, the most important thing that we could talk about here is that, you know, due to this virus, uh, we're getting tissue damage, we're getting uh, extraordinarily high amounts of inflammation, and ultimately fluid building up in the lungs, all of which is making gas exchange in the lung tissue very difficult. And so for a variety of reasons, we're seeing uh, low oxygen saturation in these patients and building the oxygen levels in the tissue is really what we're trying to achieve. And so using hyperbaric oxygen, the, the nature of how and why hyperbaric oxygen works primarily is based on gas laws. And let's just cover Henry's law quickly by increasing the pressure of oxygen, uh, we can increase the gradient. By increasing the gradient, we can deliver a much higher percentage of oxygen uh, from our lung tissue into circulation. And if we can do that, we can deliver more oxygen then to the starving tissues that are needing the oxygen for function. And if nothing else, by doing that, we're gonna allow these patients to oxygenate at a much higher level while they're fighting the virus until they can recover. The other thing that hyperbaric oxygen does is it really helps to um, balance the inflammatory reaction. And so what we also know in terms of this virus is that we're getting these significant cytokine storms. That's a term probably most of you have heard. And the cytokine storms is basically the body's reaction to the virus and this enormous inflammatory reaction that our body's having, which is also helping to lead to some of that lung tissue damage that we're talking about. So the other thing that hyperbaric oxygen would do is it helps to minimize or reduce the inflammatory reaction, uh, not so much to suppress it completely, but enough to just um, tone it down so that we're not getting as strong of this uh, cytokine storm. So I would also argue that continued care uh, with hyperbaric oxygen post-infection would also help these patients uh, improve their recovery and their healing times. But for now, we're, we're focusing primarily on using the tool uh, as a way to oxygenate these patients and control inflammation while they're fighting the infection to help them just get to the other side of the infection where they can actually recover. So um, some news I wanted to share with you guys about research. So we've already talked about the study that uh, is open and they are recruiting in New York in Langone. Uh, so that's a 40 person study that, that's ongoing as we speak. Uh, there's another study that's been approved in California, uh, but they're not recovering yet. That's going to be a great study because that study is not only looking at uh, the use of hyperbaric oxygen from an oxygenation standpoint. Uh, it's in UC uh, San Diego. They're going to be also looking at the cytokine storm specifically and seeing the effect ultimately of the use of hyperbaric oxygen, taking blood samples, measuring cytokines, and seeing that response. So that's going to be a really important one when that finally does um when the information comes out from that study. There's also another study uh, that's been uh, approved in Louisiana. They're also not recruiting yet, uh, but that should be very soon. Now, also though, there are more studies coming out worldwide. And so there's another study in the US uh, that looks like it's a multi-center uh, study. And what they're gonna be looking at primarily is they're gonna be looking at uh, a retrospective study. So it's gonna take a while to get this data, but they're gonna be looking at uh, the use of hyperbaric oxygen, and most importantly, uh, what effect was that having in terms of reducing the rate of mechanical ventilators needed? And so, you know, again, that's going to be a really important study as, you know, this virus and other viruses are probably not going away. Uh, we clearly need other alternatives or other options for these patients because, you know, as it stands right now, um, the death rate 
once on a ventilator is still very high. And so if there are ways that we could be uh, avoiding that, uh, you know, that's going to have a much higher uh, percentage positive outcome for these patients. So that's going to be a really important study, although it will take some time for them to collect that data. Um, but in addition, there's a study that is um, opening up now. They're actually recruiting in France. Uh, that's going to be a hundred person study. So that's going to be a big study um, looking at using hyperbaric oxygen for COVID-19. Uh, there's another one in Israel that's also currently recruiting. And so they're recruiting, they're doing about 30 patients. Um, now that study is going to be interesting as well. Uh, they're doing 30 patients, a little bit higher pressure. So most of the studies so far that I've seen that we've talked about in other videos, they're looking at somewhere between a 1.6 and a 2.0 uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, the one in Israel is looking a little bit higher, so they're doing about 2.2. The other studies that we've talked about are looking at somewhere between like a four to six uh, session treatment, one a day for, you know, five, let's say four, five, six days. Uh, the one in Israel, they're going to be doing eight sessions, uh, two a day. So four days, eight sessions at 2.2 atmosphere. So it's a little bit more of an aggressive study, but, um, you know, it'll be great to see what the outcome uh, of that uh, treatment protocol uh, brings us as well. So, um, so those are the new studies that are coming out that they're, I mean, they're, they're basically recruiting right now. So, you know, if you're seeing this video and you're interested and you live in one of these places, I definitely suggest that you, you look them up. We could uh, include the links below this video on how to find those studies, uh, not only to, uh, sign up if you're interested in signing up or, uh, but even just to follow the studies, uh, so that you can see the outcomes as we're getting the information. So, um, you know, so obviously, you know, we will get more information soon over the next handful of months. You know, a lot of this data will, will be generated. So we'll be able to talk about that. I'll bring more videos as that happens. But in the meantime, you know, we're really, we're forced to rely on these small case studies to understand uh, what people are doing and how patients are responding. And so, you know, there've been some comments on some videos saying, you know, well, this is just, you know, preliminary data. You know, we can't really go off of this yet. You know, Everything about this virus is preliminary. We've only been dealing with this. The world has only been dealing with this virus for a handful of months. So literally everything we're doing is new. Everything we're doing is innovative or it should be because, you know, the traditional routes are, are not seemingly uh, as effective as we would have hoped. And so we need to look for other options and we need to look for uh, positive data and we need to uh, have an open mind as to other alternatives you know, for these patients to be able to um, at least choose what types of treatments they want or should have throughout the course of their care. So um, in, that, in that realm, we've already talked about a few case studies that have come out. There was the group in Chicago that was using uh, pressurized oxygen helmets. So it's not quite hyperbaric, but it's still positive pressure helmets allowing an increased amount of oxygen absorption. Um, and they were having uh, great results using those helmets in Chicago. Uh, since then, I've heard a few other hospitals starting to uh, use these helmets, which is a very positive uh, approach in my mind, that it's non-invasive and can help oxygenate these patients. We also talked about the um, Opalescence uh, General Hospital in Louisiana. They were using hyperbaric. Uh, I think they treated, at least at the time that I saw it last, they had treated six patients uh, with hyperbaric, positive COVID, uh, with respiratory distress, all of which responded very favorably and were discharged from the hospital. Uh, there was another hospital in California, treated about five patients um, with, with positive results as well. And so I want to bring this, this, this next one that uh, was just brought to my attention a couple days ago. Uh, and I'll obviously I'll put a link to this study as well, Journal of Wound Care. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy in preventing mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 patients, retrospective case series. So again, it's a small group. We don't have a lot of data yet. We're trying. We're trying to collect more data. Um, but, you know, we're, we're taking these small sample sizes just to say, hey, is, are we on the right track here? And so in this particular study, uh, we're looking at five cases. Uh, in all five cases, we were treating at two atmospheres for 90 minutes, uh, five sessions, okay? Which is pretty much the standard that I've been seeing in most of the uh, research coming out so far on COVID-19. And uh, here are the results, all patients recovered without the need for mechanical ventilation following hyperbaric oxygen therapy, oxygen saturations increased, uh, heart rate 
uh, balanced and inflammatory markers all fell. Uh, at the time of this writing, three of the five patients have been discharged from the hospital to remain stable condition. So, I mean, this is literally happening as we're speaking um, and, and there's more of this to come. But again, the whole purpose of these videos and the whole purpose of me trying to bring this attention is just to say, patients need options. Uh, we need less invasive and more effective treatment options for patients who are going through this process so that we can have better outcomes, period. And so here we are, another case report coming out showing that positive result. Again, not only looking at uh, oxygenation alone, but also looking at oxygenation and uh, inflammatory markers, because those are two of the main clinical signs of this infection. And so seeing both of those have positive results gives us a lot of hope that this is a good tool. It's an appropriate tool to be using for these cases. Uh, as more information comes out, I promise to update everybody. Uh, in the meantime, like I said, below this video, I'll add all the links to uh, what we're talking about today. Thanks a lot.